Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. Today we're going to look at models of our solar system and how these have changed over the centuries as our understanding has increased. Astronomy is often considered the oldest science. Humans have always looked to the sky, seeing the sun, moon and stars above us. The motion of the sun is particularly important. To the earliest humans it gave us day and night and seasons of warm and cold, wet and dry. Then, around 12,000 years ago, we learned to plant food. We transitioned from being mostly nomadic, moving to new areas to find more food, to settling down and farming, planting crops and waiting for them to grow before harvesting them. Now the seasons became more important. People learned when crops should be sown and when they should be harvested. They needed to keep track of time, and we developed calendars based on the sun's movement. Humans are great at seeing patterns, and people thought they could see shapes in the stars. Many cultures gave these shapes names and personalities, often believing them to be gods or similar, and so constellations were created. Different cultures saw different shapes, even when they were looking at the same stars, and cultures far to the north would see some stars that southern cultures couldn't see, and vice versa. Some cultures decided to honour these gods, by building monuments that aligned with certain stars on certain days of the year. However, they didn't realise that the Earth is a spinning globe and that it wobbles over time, so that the axis of its rotation points in different directions. Over thousands of years, their carefully aligned pyramids, temples and observatories were pointing in the wrong direction. Using Stellarium, we can see this effect, called precession. This goes in a 26,000 year cycle. Today, Polaris is the pole star, very close to the North Celestial Pole. But when the ancient Egyptians were building the pyramids, Thuban was the pole star. Vega takes its turn as well. Sometimes there is no bright pole star, and currently there's no bright pole star for the Southern Hemisphere. So precession changes how the stars appear in the sky. But the stars also actually move. They're very far away so their movement isn't noticeable from night to night, but it can be quite dramatic over thousands of years. Let's look back to the North Celestial Pole, where we can see Ursa Minor. The shape of the asterism changes notably over thousands of years. And Cassiopeia, a nice W shape today, appears completely different as time goes by. We've talked a lot about the positions of stars, but there's an important thing we haven't mentioned yet. Thousands of years ago, astronomers noticed that some bright stars do change their position from one night to the next. The ancient Greeks called them planetes, or wanderers, the planets. Here we can see Mars moving across the sky over a few months, as well as some other planets. The Greeks defined seven planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, but also the Sun and the Moon. The stars, so they thought, were fixed in position and the planets wandered about the sky. Around 400 BC, the Greek astronomer Plato explained that the planets all orbit the Earth in perfect circles. Now, for a long time the Babylonians and Greeks had recorded the positions of the planets, and these observations showed that they don't move in perfect circles. But many Greek philosophers at the time, including Plato, didn't like evidence and observations, and ignored any data that didn't fit their theories. Plato stated that each planet was held in a spherical shell made of crystal that rotated around the Earth. There were eight shells in total, including an outermost one that held the stars up. Now, as I mentioned, the planets do not appear to go in perfect circles. Let's watch Mars again. It moves happily across the sky, but then it slows down and moves backwards for a bit. This backwards motion is called retrograde motion, and a few centuries after Plato, this was explained by Ptolemy. He was still convinced that the planets must move in perfect circles, but he said that they orbit the Earth in big circles called deference, and little circles called epicycles. 
This explained the orbits very well, and an unknown Greek around that time used this system to build the Antikythera mechanism, a clockwork computer that tracked the orbits. Ptolemy's system remained our best theory for centuries, until Nicolaus Copernicus in Poland in the 16th century. He suggested that the Sun is at the centre of the universe, and all the planets orbit around it. The Earth, he said, was just another planet, and the only thing that orbits us is the Moon. Like Ptolemy, Copernicus believed the orbits should be perfect circles, and this didn't match observations, so Copernicus used the same system of epicycles. The old model, where everything orbits the Earth, is called geocentric. Copernicus's new model, with the Sun in the centre, is called heliocentric. Any model of the planets needs to explain retrograde motion, which we saw earlier with Mars. The planets appear to travel from west to east from one night to the next, but then occasionally reverse direction, spending a few weeks moving from east to west. However, this is an illusion. With Copernicus's orbits around the Sun, he realised that this happens when a planet is closest in its orbit to Earth, and it's just a matter of perspective, as shown here. Mars continues in its normal orbit, but the Earth is moving faster. You've probably seen a similar effect on a train, where you overtake another train moving in the same direction, but the other train looks like it's moving backwards. A few years later, Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer, was unhappy with these complex epicycles, and he carried out some very precise observations, especially of Mars. He found that he could explain his observations without epicycles, but still using perfect circles. If, he said, that all the planets orbit the Sun, but that the Sun itself orbits the Earth. He believed that the Bible clearly states that the Earth doesn't move, although modern biblical scholars think those passages are just poetic. Brahe did some work with his friend and assistant, Johannes Kepler. And after Brahe died, Kepler continued to work on the solar system. Using Brahe's detailed observations of Mars, Kepler realised that he could make a much simpler model if he didn't restrict himself to perfect circles. Instead, he placed the Sun at the centre and gave the planets elliptical orbits. Kepler's system matched observations better than any earlier system. Now, Copernicus wasn't the first to put the Sun at the centre. Aristarchus, a Greek astronomer, had suggested this 2,000 years earlier, but it hadn't really caught on. Nor was Copernicus the most famous proponent of the heliocentric model. That title would go to Galileo Galilei. You see, Copernicus didn't publish his work until he lay on his deathbed. It was controversial in the Christian church, but they couldn't do much to a dead man. Seventy years later, Galileo took the model much further and ended up in trouble with the Catholic Church. Galileo learned of a new invention, the telescope, and built one to study the sky. Church doctrine stated that the heavens are perfect, fixed and immutable. But in 1604, a new star appeared in the sky, a supernova. The heavens weren't as fixed as the Church claimed. The sun, it was claimed, is perfect, but using his telescope, Galileo observed blotches on the sun's surface, sunspots. This could not be if the sun was perfect. We know that the moon has dark and light regions, but the church had always held that it was a perfectly smooth sphere. Galileo looked through his telescope and saw shadows cast by mountains. The moon was not perfectly smooth. The Church claims that all the planets orbit Earth, but when Galileo observed Venus over many months, he saw its phase change, sometimes gibbous and sometimes crescent. It also changed in size. Galileo realised that when it was a large crescent, it was between us and the Sun, and when it was small and gibbous, it was the other side of the Sun. Clearly, Venus orbits the Sun. And most convincing of all, Galileo watched Jupiter, he saw four small bright lights. Over many days, these lights were always near Jupiter, but changed position. They were Jupiter's four largest moons orbiting another planet. In other words, they did not orbit Earth. When Galileo published his findings, 
he was investigated by the Inquisition, who declared his work heretical, but only told him to stop publishing it. In fact, the new Pope Urban VIII actually liked Galileo, and was interested in his ideas. But then, in 1632, Galileo published another book, ridiculing the Pope and the Church. He was tried, again, found guilty of heresy, again, and sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life. Our last figure in the story is the English astronomer Isaac Newton. Kepler had described the orbits of the planets as ellipses, but it was Newton who explained this. He said that the same thing that makes apples fall from trees also keeps planets in their orbits, the force of gravity. He went on to do the maths and figured out the gravitation equation you see here. The force of gravity between two objects is proportional to the two objects' masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Because the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, this is called an inverse square law. You should understand this, but you don't need to memorise the equation for the GCSE. In a moment, I'm going to spend a little time looking into Kepler's theory in more depth. But first, let's summarise the history we've learnt today. Around 10,000 BC in the Levant, people developed agriculture and tracked the seasons with calendars based on the sun. Around 2600 BC, Egyptians built pyramids, aligned to important stars. These alignments are not perfect today because of precession. The Earth's axis changes in a 26,000 year cycle. Back then, Thuban was the northern pole star. Around 400 BC, Plato, a Greek astronomer, said that seven planets, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, orbit the Earth in perfect circles. In 150 BC, Ptolemy, another Greek astronomer, improved on Plato's work, introducing epicycles to the planet's orbits and giving more accurate predictions. 1543 AD, Copernicus, a Polish astronomer, suggested the planets orbit the Sun, but still used epicycles. By then, Polaris was, and still is, the northern pole star. 1588 AD, Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer, eliminated epicycles and had the planets orbiting the Sun in perfect circles but the Sun still orbiting the Earth, also in a perfect circle. 1605 AD Johannes Kepler, a German astronomer, proposed that all planets, including the Earth, orbit the Sun in ellipses rather than perfect circles. 1610 AD Galileo Galilei, an Italian astronomer, presented his evidence in support of the heliocentric model, including supernovae, sunspots, lunar mountains, the phases of Venus, and the moons of Jupiter. 1687 AD. Isaac Newton, an English astronomer, published his calculations explaining Kepler's elliptical orbits. Now, Kepler did a lot more than just say the planets moved in ellipses. He started to work on the maths, and he stated three laws. Kepler's first law is simple. An ellipse has two focuses, or rather foci. And Kepler said that for every planet's orbit, the Sun is at one focus. The other focus is empty. Kepler also realised that planets move faster when they're closer to the Sun. His second law states, a line segment joining a planet and the Sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. What does this mean? Look at the diagram. The blue sections each show how far the Earth has travelled in one month. The sections shaded in blue each have equal area. The time intervals for these are also equal. This only works if the planet moves slower when it's further away. And we can see that on the left it travelled further in one month than it did on the right. Note that these ellipses are highly exaggerated compared with the Earth's orbit. Kepler's third law relates the orbital period, a planet's year, to its average distance from the Sun. We can see these figures for the planets Kepler knew about. If you want to draw the graph yourself, pause the video now. Well, we'd hoped for a nice straight line, but that's not what we got. Period and distance are clearly not proportional. Kepler tried a few variations and came up with using distance cubed 
and period squared. Again, if you want to do this yourself, pause the video now. Here are the numbers, and here is the graph we got. This shows a straight line, but most of the planets are really bunched up. The numbers for the first four planets are really close compared with Jupiter and Saturn. This kind of thing often happens in astronomy, and we like to use logarithms. You need to understand this, and you may be asked to plot data on a logarithmic graph in the exam. All this means is that instead of each graph division going up by the same amount, they're each ten times the previous number. I've linked a Khan Academy video in the description that goes into more detail. In our logarithmic graph, we can clearly see a straight line showing that period squared is proportional to distance cubed, and this is Kepler's third law. So now you know how our understanding of the solar system has evolved and improved over time, as we gained more observations, increased our mathematical skills, and eventually developed telescopes. Our knowledge and understanding continues to develop, and today is a very exciting time to be an astronomer. Thank you for watching, goodbye, and have an excellent day.